too. All right, we're back, and our next speaker is Frank Dempsey, and he'll talk to us about uh, variable star uh, observing uh, with a photoelectrometer. Okay, thanks, Paul. So we're all set? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the uh, title slide uh, says quite a lot. It's been 35 years, actually it's closer to 40 since I started using um, a photoelectric photometer for variable star observing. And so let's just see if we can advance the slides here. Give you some idea of what it is. It's this little hand-sized sort of uh, object at the end of the telescope you see labeled on the picture I have on the left side here. Um, it's what the scope I've currently been using for it. So a little photometer about the size of my hand and you see it's in size in relation to an eight inch or 200 millimeter uh, telescope and the, the hut itself is sitting on the right to give you some perspective for size. But that is what a photometer looks like. Uh, I could just mention uh, uh, before I got this for several years I was planning to build one. And so there are numerous plans around and photometry had been in, photoelectric photometry had been in use for uh, quite a few years before that, and there's, um, um, there, there were various plans around, and I was planning to build one, and um, I, I relied on a couple of people who knew quite a lot more about electronics than I did, and uh, they gradually disappeared. One moved far away to a new job, and another one got married, so. Um, and at about that time, mid-1980s, uh, this commercially made unit became available. And I think I had a picture here somewhere. Oh, here it is, Sky and Telescope magazine, uh, mid-1980s, so you see an ad, and so in those days, uh, believe it or not, you would, you, would, you would write a letter to the, to the manufacturer or the address in the ad and ask for more information. So um, anyway, um, I eventually got a photometer and decided it's a pretty reasonable deal and um, pretty well built and had good reviews and uh, people were doing quite a lot of good science with it on small telescopes. So that's where it appeared uh, first, um, Sky and Telescope. It just gives you some sort of idea of the picture of uh, the layout of it. So you see on far left, um, the uh, nose piece that goes into um, where your eyepiece would go in the telescope, as I showed you in the back of that uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope. At the top is um, an eyepiece with a reticle. So a flip mirror, flip mirror uh, um, directs the light up to the eyepiece so you can center the star, the target star in the reticle, and then you flip the mirror out of the way and then light path goes directly to the detector, which causes a digital readout to appear on a digital display. And that's the number that we'd record for the output of the photometer. And if you're curious about the, Electronics, here's the, on the right side, you see a picture of the back cover removed. And, and lower half, I, I put a little diagram, but didn't want to get into too many details unless you're really curious about it. Um, it's basically a self-contained unit. Um, in that uh, era, there were numerous resources available by then for, for doing photoelectric photometry. And it was quite a well-advanced field that a lot of amateur astronomers were doing. And I thought pretty darn interesting. Um, so there are various books, uh, the, uh, uh, Journal in the lower right is the IAPPP. Um, that was pretty well known too, and it was a quarterly sort of journal. Um, and on the right is a um, monthly or pro possibly bi-monthly news newsletter from the AVSO PEP or photoelectric photometry section. So there are quite a lot of good resources available to help uh, get started and get going in it. Uh, there's another resource that's online, and if you're really curious, you could uh, access this probably for free without needing to be an AVSO member. But um, the current um, photoelectric photometry observer's guide has quite a lot of information. In case you're curious, you want to look into more of it, you could. Um, so it's the AVSO, and thought I should briefly mention what is the American Association of Amateur of Variable Star Observers. Uh, so I'm not here to um, sell it or sell you membership in it or promote it, but I would just say that it's the prime organization, uh, one of the main best well-known organizations in the world for collecting and encouraging um, observations of variable stars from amateur astronomers and professional astronomers. So um, quite a well-known organization. Didn't want to read off uh, a lot of information, but there is on this slide if you're really curious. But um, aavso.org is the website. As I said, I'm not here to uh, talk about it. Um, it's just that the um, um, uh, photometry I've been doing, I chose to do it with the AAVSO photoelectric photometry program that they had in place, and it's still running. Um, so to give you some idea of what's going on here, uh, the idea is to uh, collect uh, observations, of the, observations of the brightness of a variable star. And here you see a light curve which plots the magnitude on a vertical scale and the date or time on a horizontal scale. So from left to right, I plotted here the past 400 days of a, a well-known star called Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse is probably the best known um, red supergiant that's um, quite variable. It's quite well known because several years ago it dipped suddenly in brightness. Um, and so the point of this chart here is it plots um, photoelectric photometry 
magnitudes in the green dots. And they, I should say that they're to a precision of 0 0.01 magnitude. And the best that a visual observer can generally do under good circumstances is about a tenth of a magnitude, some cases better. Uh, however, in this case, um, this also plots visual observations that people make of star Betelgeuse and is vastly more complicated because you need uh, comparison stars that are similar in brightness nearby and don't differ by too much so-called air mass or, <clears throat> or um, distance that allows a lot of extinction when this one star is further away, too far away from another star to make a good estimate. And so a lot of other details, including the color, how it affects your eye or the detector. So um, you shouldn't be too surprised that you see here, the visual estimates of Betelgeuse here are all over the place, they're quite wide. And so if you didn't have the photoelectric uh, curve in green here, just imagine the, the black dots and it would be quite a mess and you would probably have a hard time saying, you'd say yes, it's variable, but have a hard time doing really good analysis of it. So just in comparison, uh, I think the photoelectric photometry magnitudes are pretty darn precise, pretty good. So that uh, illustrates the advantage. I think it gives you some idea of the advantage of a um, photometer and photometry and why photometry is preferred for certain stars. Uh, so let's um, past 400 days. So I plotted another one. I won't show you any more comparison with visuals, um, but the um, photoelectric photometry magnitudes for the past five years approximately are plotted here. And so I mentioned that a few years ago, many of you may remember that Betelgeuse dipped suddenly in brightness and it was noticeably dimmer and it really changed the appearance of um, the constellation Orion in the sky because Betelgeuse had dipped quite a bit. And you see that dip uh, in magnitude right about the middle of the scale here um, a few years ago. Uh, so the other point here is that um, it's not a regular variation, so um, it's well known to have uh, approximately a 400 day period, but there are other periods of variability superimposed on that. So it's quite a lot of stuff going on in this variable star, and so it's, it's a re reason why it's a target for ongoing photometry and ob observations. So that's why I'm picking this one to give you some idea of, um, or at least flavor for why, um, why we observe variable stars, because it's really interesting, and the benefit in this case of photometry. Uh, so this is, um, if I plot the same chart here, just a bit of self-promotion, just to show that the observations that I've made are in orange crosses, so I plotted them here too. And you can do this if you um, go to the uh, AAVSO website, you can plot any star if you want to plot a graph and see what's going on, and um, don't need to have membership in it to do that. It's one of the many options available to anybody who wants to look at it. So uh, just a bit of self-promotion so to show that my uh, observations fortunately line up with uh, many other people's observations, otherwise there'd be something wrong. I'd be doing something really wrong here. Um, but it's um, uh, it's an interesting case here of, um, uh, of um, observe it whenever you can, and uh, sometimes uh, my observations are unique and they help fill in a light curve. Other times they, they correspond with many other people's when there's maybe good weather across North America for several days at a time or whatever, and there's good coverage of a certain part of the light curve. Anyway, a lot of details here. I won't go too far into that. Um, so um, I could give you some quick uh, idea of the procedure of how to do photometry. And so it, it requires centering the target star in the reticle. And then I flip the mirror out of the way, and then starlight focuses on the detector, and it shows up on the digital display, which we record that number that rep represents the output. There are some arithmetic transformations to do, and we end up with the magnitude of the star. And submit that to the AVSO, and that's the data point. And then uh, after that, it's quite a lot of work, really, and it takes time, and after that, I um, get some sleep. Okay, um, what else did I put in here? Um, uh, I have a few more details in case you're curious about the sequence, and so, um, Typically we, typically, we do um, uh, three observations of the variable star and um, sandwiched or preceded and followed by a comparison star. So it's always uh, reporting the magnitude of a variable star in comparison to a comparison. We call it a comparison. So um, after you do three of them, you see number eight showing a check star, so that's a second uh, comparison star. So uh, do the check star also preceded and followed by the chosen selected comparison star. That's in case the comparison star turns out to be variable itself which it occasionally does, so, or the check star might be variable as well. Anyway, um, some complications here, but that's a general sort of uh, common sequence, and um, you can visualize it here by doing, uh, fill in this chart, that's basically what I do. Fill in this chart for each observation. There's 18 rows and um, time each integration of 30 seconds, and then eventually get a mean, and that's how I um, take those uh, numbers, and that's, um, that's what we use. So in case you're curious, I wouldn't want to say too much about arithmetic. Um, I'm sure you didn't come here to hear about it, but um, 
the, the light flux equation is based on the definition of stellar magnitudes. So it's based on the fact that five magnitudes difference is exactly 100, difference, 100 times difference in brightness or light flux units. And light flux units is what the photometer measures. And so in that case, um, one, one magnitude is um, one fifth the root of 100 or 2.512 or approximately two and a half. So end up with the equations at the bottom showing how to, um, especially the bottom one, difference in magnitude between the variable and comparison is given by this uh, little equation in case you're curious. So I just wanted to point that out that that's sort of what's involved in taking the numbers off the photometer and converting them to a stellar magnitude. So I showed you, I picked up one example here to show you the actual spreadsheet that I use and this is a star de Neb, which you may not have known as a variable star because you would probably say, well that's a bright blue star and variable stars are red. Yes, but a lot of stars are pretty darn interesting when you start to actually measure them. Anyway, um, this uh, shows you the, uh, on the left the, um, the three observations I mentioned and the mean and then the scale, mean divided by scale, the star minus the sky, minus the sky background, um, so a logarithm and um, eventually on the um, uh, third column from the right you see the, um, the um, magnitude difference between the comparison and the variable. In this case all three are 2.68 um, and so in this case the standard deviation is 0 0.004 so precision of 0 0.004 magnitude is pretty darn good. Um, and I didn't want to say too much, in fact I took out the slide they put in about error analysis standard deviation I, I'm 100% sure that 100% of you in the room didn't come here to hear about that. However, uh, error analysis, analysis and signal-to-noise ratio is 100% of the importance of photometry uh, important, and paying attention to all the factors that affect it. So I'll just briefly mention it, but I didn't want to say too much about it. Um, uh, speaking of Deneb, I think I put in a chart here. I did. I put in a light curve. So just you can see that um, over the past few years, um, um, we've been doing some measurements of Deneb. It varies between you know, magnitude 1.23 and about 1.29 or so on. Um, you couldn't really detect it by eye. So, uh, but a photometer shows up these differences and um, somebody started a campaign, a campaign in the AVSO to have us start measuring these, uh, this particular star and so we did and turn up some very interesting details. But still underway, a uh, study is still underway, but it's just one interesting example. Um, I just picked that one because I showed you Betelgeuse earlier, which is also a very bright star. Uh, so um, what are the target stars? Well, it's quite a list in the photometry program. And so I just picked off the first screenshot of the first page of the list here. And so they go from, uh, let's see, the fourth, the column um, underneath D and E is the uh, right ascension. So just the stars that are at right ascension zero hours up to one hour are shown on this page. So you say about 24 times this is roughly the number of stars that um, uh, could be studied by photometry. And one of them I recognize TV Pisces is one that we do fairly, I do fairly regularly, have been doing for decades. Um, but anyway, just some of those stars, but um, even more important, the current photom photoelectric photometry program, the AVSO has a few selected targets, and these are the ones here that we're currently doing for the current season. Uh, and so um, Rho cast and V509 casts have been studied for years, and it's um, a re a really s a spectacularly amazing um, yellow hypergiant. V509 cast, but wouldn't want to get too distracted on that. Um, Lucifei is also a very interesting star that I've been measuring for decades, and um, it's also called Garnet's Red Star. So if you're not aware of it, um, you can see it. It's around fifth magnitude. You see it in binoculars, if not by eye, and it's one of the reddest stars in the sky. So it's really neat to look at. Anyway, didn't want to get too distracted on any of these. I uh, just wanted to show you that there are some stars that we're currently doing. Uh, we do each year and every season, depending on um, selected programs and campaigns, and speaking of campaigns, I think I threw one in here, or here it is, a current campaign uh, that's requesting uh, photometry observations, Sigma Gem, um, in support of a couple of satellite uh, programs, and I think at the bottom it says, um, uh, or I put the asterisk by it, um, um, I just try to read it a little bit here, photoelectric photometry observations are the most practical and most requested way to observe this because of the brightness, sig gem, and some other details um, related to how close comparison stars are and how bright it is and so on. So it's just one of the stars and just one example of a current campaign requesting uh, photometry observations. Uh, so I, I, th I thought I'd mention a few rules about photometry, also to give you some idea of how it's done and 
uh, why it's a little bit uh, of a um, strict sort of hobby. Um, I met, briefly mentioned that comparison stars need to be a similar color as a target and non-varying. So hopefully, hopefully the chosen comparison stars are not varying, but sometimes they do turn out to be variable themselves. Um, even more crucial, we need clear sky, no clouds, steady sky brightness, steady transparency. And that means, uh, that, that means um, no moonlight nearby that's changing, twilight can't be uh, affecting it, uh, we can't have changing um, cloud cover, it's got to be zero clouds. So there's very strict conditions where I do photometry. Um, and so the cartoon I put in shows, um, uh, I've got to look through the eyepiece to, of the photometer to center the target and the reticle. And when I see the sky turning green and bright, uh-oh, turn around and look up, and there's a roar blasting up. This has happened a few times. And OK, time to pack it up and uh, fast forward to the, the bottom point. I'll show you in a slide earlier about the procedure, not go to sleep. Um, and so there's also some other strict requirements about the color filter for the photometer and transformations uh, for that um, filter to be transformed so that the observation from the photometer can be converted to a standard photometric system and be compared with uh, other observations from other um, observatories around the world and spacecraft all based on a similar photometric set of filters. Uh, filter transformations, a bit of arithmetic involved in doing that too and it takes some effort to do it fine. I uh, won't uh, waste your time on that. Um, I just briefly mentioned that there are errors to watch out for and try to minimize errors. And so, um, so I'll just give you, try to give you some idea of what's involved in the hobby here by saying uh, these are things to watch out for. Uh, one is dew on the optics. So you may be familiar with, um, yeah, you're using a, a, a telescope with a corrector plate on the front or glass on the front end, it might be a refractor, and you see things starting to get foggy and hazy, and you find out that your, uh, um, your, your dew, uh, dew heater has stopped working and um, maybe have a wonky wire connection and the plug is loose. Anybody, anybody ever seen that? Quite possibly. Anyway, that's one of the hassles to put up with and uh, keep an eye on it and don't try not to let that happen. Um, watch out for setting up the wrong target or comparison star. Um, easy to do when there's, say, something like moonlight and you can't see all the faint stars that we, we, we normally rely on to, to, to choose the correct comparison star. Um, imperfect tracking, yes, does your tracking motor ever suddenly stop or go wonky or, or start slowing down and, um, so that your um, target star doesn't stay in the reticle of the um, photometer? That uh, sure does happen. Is it possible to, to make a mistake uh, data reading? It sure is. Is it possible to make a mistake with recording the wrong date and time? It sure is. Um, it, and watch out for darn really bad uh, nuisance clouds when you think the sky is clear and then one little cloud appears, you say, where the heck did that come from? Or you didn't even see it, and then you see it right in your field of view, say, hey, I thought the sky was clear. So we've got to watch out for that stuff. Uh, satellites and aircraft, so normally I can see them coming. Okay, so often you can, but contrails are a real nuisance. Um, so I mentioned the sky needs to be uniformly clear and uh, dark or bright during the, um, during the period of the observation so that it doesn't vary from one observation to the next. Contrails are a bit of a, quite a bit of a nuisance. Uh, so are fireflies in the summertime. Um, one of the worst of all is uh, uh, when you see a whole long line of satellites coming right toward your field of view and say, oh man, what's going on here? Maybe I should just um, take a break for a cup of tea. But it can take a few minutes for a whole long train of satellites to go by. So I'm blaming Starlink here, but uh, it's worse than that now. Um, what's, there's now an Amazon um, constellation of satellites being launched, and um, I think there's a British one as well. Uh, don't want to talk about it, I didn't want computer to talk about negative uh, thoughts, so let's skip that. Get on to the next slide. Uh, comparison stars, just to give you some idea, you may or may not be able to read the, the charts here, but just put in a couple of examples. Uh, the one on the left is for Betelgeuse, and you may not see it, but um, the chart that I use here, I just took an image of it. Um, Betelgeuse is sort of near the upper left there, it's a fairly bright star, and um, you may not see the stars I've circled for check star and comparison star. Um, they got to be telescope has to be navigated to them, and, and that's fine. I'm quite familiar with those fields of view. Uh, but the one on the right is for another star, and it's got some fainter stars, and um, if there's bright moonlight, um, I'm blasting um, brightness across the sky, and it's far harder to see those fainter stars, and it takes far more caution and care to get centered on the correct star. So there's, um, um, there's some challenges involved here, and it adds extra complexity to the um, hobby, but it's fine. Um, well, so I, I thought I'd set up here, uh, sorry, there can be quite a variation of great conditions for photometry from one year to the next. 
So some years get away with a lot of observations. Other years get away with, uh, looks like uh, 20 minutes is up. Um, the um, so our list for 2021 is a good dozen or more, and 2022 uh, had a reasonable number too. Uh, for 2023, I've only got half a dozen so far, and they're all last winter. And um, uh, so similar with visual observing, uh, it was a bad year for uh, smoke because every time the sky cleared and wind came from north, it brought down smoke. And so um, I saw smoke getting in the way of doing reliable photometry right through end of September. So I uh, just put in a, a chart at the bottom showing one example from May where you, you may remember that smoke is pretty darn thick. Thick smoke across the um, sky um, really messed up our views. So um, made it hard for doing anything like deep sky observing. Um, and so for photometry, it was a total no-no because it means uh, sky, sky transparency can vary during the 20 minutes. So um, it's a no-no, it's a bad year because of smoke. That was the point here. Uh, anything else? Um, yes, just for going into the future, um, are there current campaigns going on? Yes. Are there going to be future campaigns requesting our observations? Very likely, yes, probably. Um, so I just put in again this chart showing Betelgeuse because it's a non-regular star and um, you'd say, um, what's the future for it? Well, we don't know, can't tell because it's a very interesting varying star and it's, um, it just uh, invites for continuing observations. So um, this is just one example of um, um, reason to continue photometry into the future, to monitor this star and many others. So um, that's how I see the future. So I, sh I should also say, do I need to do photometry? There are online telescopes where you can pay money and telescopes are set up somewhere in an observatory. You can get photometry of a star. So why waste my time when I can just um, go online and get some, um, get some telescopes to do it automatically? Um, there's also data mining that could be done. There's a huge amount of uh, data and photometric observations of stars waiting for people to analyze, downloaded from satellites that are monitoring the sky constantly. Um, and there are also uh, numerous automated photometric sky surveys being built and uh, just about in, uh, actually this one example I put here is, has been operating for a couple of years. Uh, <clears throat> Well, this one uses uh, eight-inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes pointed at the sky in a big, huge array. Um, there's a, another set called um, yeah, I can't, didn't remember the name, but the, there's a small automatic telescope you can buy now. Um, I forget its name. Uh, they're fairly common. They're fairly widespread because they're totally automatic, uh, totally electronic, nothing to um, uh, connect. But um, s surveys are being set up with those too. But anyway, the point is, and there's also um, Huge uh, observatories about to come on uh, online, uh, Vera Rubin and some other observatories that are going to do um, photometric sky surveys constantly every night. And it's considered that when this um, every scope, as one example, as this, when this every scope um, at University of North Carolina comes on, becomes available to um, share its data, um, it'll, it'll, um, it'll mean the end of variable star observing. There'll be no more need for variable star observers to report to the AVSO because all the stars will be monitored by these automatic observatories. So it could end soon, maybe. However, if I ask myself, do I need to do photometry? Um, my answer is yes, just continue. So this is the last slide. I'm going to continue doing photometry. Data continues to be valuable and useful. I find it to be fun and relaxing. I thought I'd point out uh, a few quotes from um, um, Dr. John Percy, who's a uh, I've been fortunate to have, to have him as a great mentor in this program. He's been with this program for as long as I've been in it. Uh, he headed the uh, photoelectric photometry program in the AVSO when I joined. Um, and this is from the um, PEP Observer's Guide that I briefly showed or mentioned to you. Um, quotes from Dr. John Percy from years ago from somewhere else. So I'll just read several lines. Choose a program which fits your equipment, site, ability, and your time available. There are definite advantages to working with a group on an established program or campaign. And photometry should be available, should be enjoyable, as well as satisfying. And so all these apply to me when I think and, and when I reflect, like no pun intended, but when I reflect on the past few decades since I've been doing this, these all, these lines that John Percy wrote years ago, all apply to what I've been doing. So I find it uh, fun and relaxing. And so for that reason, I'll be continuing. So I was going to say, I, I, I could say, um, um, I, I might, it might be tempting to say that this has been a great journey, but it's better to say this is a, a good journey, ongoing, fun journey that I'm enjoying. Anyway, that's my last slide, so I'll finish here, and thank you for your time.
sharing your journey and continuing your journey uh, with us. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? One? Hey, Frank, excellent talk. I'm wondering if you could show your first slide of Betelgeuse observations with optical and photometric. So there's a gap in the optical that the photometric observations continue through. Is that full moon or some other reason? Uh, it's an interesting uh, thing that's come available in the past. A guy started a couple of years ago. First of all, there's, um, there's a gap in every variable star observation where it's, uh, it's near the sun and people can't observe it. Um, furthermore, it's worth while well, photometry, photometry can't handle those tight periods when it's in twilight close to the sun, but visual observers can. Um, in this case, um, I didn't want to uh, point out that, but it's a good question because um, a guy started doing um, um, showing that photometry of Betelgeuse could be accomplished using uh, GOES weather satellites. So he showed um, an, Im an image of um, the Earth from, from, the goal, from geostationary satellites showing all its weather patterns and so on, but showing Betelgeuse in the background and enough stars that he claimed that he could do photometry. So he, he, got, he perfected that, so he's been doing good, um, good high precision observations using those satellite images of the Earth with Betelgeuse in the background. So that's, that's where the gap gets filled in past year or two. So Betelgeuse is photobombing the Earth in the photo, in the picture. Okay. So it's, a, it's an interesting question, uh, it's, but it's a very interesting technique that's been, this guy has been um, yeah. developing. Now in your, in your um, further slide where you showed your observations along with the other ones, yeah. So are yours biased a little brighter than the others, or do you think it's sort of a mix? Uh, well, it's tricky because um, you see in some cases they line up perfectly, but you see in any particular case, such as where the arrow points to, um, you see it's tricky there because you see at that particular uh, date and time where my observations are, there's quite a range, although the precision should be fairly, uh, should be uh, 0.0 in magnitude for observations submitted to the database, there's quite a variation there. There's the variation of, of um, um, I wouldn't say a whole tenth of magnitude, but mm -hmm. I would say uh, let's say maybe 0 0.05 magnitude, uh, just just from uh, one point in time, just from a whole bunch of observers whose um, precision ought to be 0 0.01 magnitude or better. So short answer, why that is, I'm not sure, I don't know. But that's a, uh, partly the benefit of um, combining a lot of observations together. Which one is right, which one is wrong? Nobody will ever know, because right. there's, there's who, whose basis is correct. Right, thank you. I've got a, um, I guess, a technical question and a more general question. Um, the technical question is, what's the field of that photometer? Because you'll have background stars of various brightness. How does the system deal with that? Uh, so the way I deal with that is that um, the focal length of the telescope de determines, because it's a fixed radical on the photometer, so the focal length of the telescope determines, determines what exactly that field of view is. And I'm not sure, I can't give you a, a number in seconds of arc but it's some fixed number of seconds of arc. And I've used different, <clears throat> different telescopes in the past. I've used uh, my 10-inch reflector, 6-inch reflector, and um, I'm about to switch from the 8-inch reflector I showed you to another 8-inch reflector, and I might set up to do my, use my 11-inch SCT, which is currently for sale, but if I don't sell it, I might set up to use it for photometry, and then it'll have an even tighter field of view. So um, the problem is, is that sometimes uh, some of the stars um, on the program are too tight. They're close to a double star. And so I can't really do them. I can't really separate the star by keeping the target star in the middle of the reticle and keeping out a, ne a nearby neighborhood, neighboring star, which is bright enough to contribute some brightness. Can't do it. So people with uh, a longer focal length and a smaller field of view can do it. And so I could do it too by inserting a Barlow or sometimes a Fabry lens gives a wider field of view, but I could insert more lenses, but that would mess up and require me to do uh, another transformation observation because of the transformation we've messed up because um, the whole set of um, light passing through the glass will change a little bit for anyways. It's a complicated um, um, set of um, answers related to transformation. But the point is, is that um, yes, there are some stars that are um, too close together so that some will be in the field of view and contribute light. And I just say, okay, can't do it, don't do it. Most of them, the ones that I've chosen, all, all work out because um, uh, you can see the target star, such as Betelgeuse, and there aren't any background stars within that field of view bright enough to affect it. 
So it's, uh, of course, there are some fainter ones, yes. You could always say that there are some fainter, if you look to 12th, 14th, or 18th magnitude, they would be there. But um, there are all stars that I've chosen that I can, I can, my system can handle to avoid that problem. Okay, and I guess the more general question, and you may have alluded to it already, or an answer to it, is looking at that data between the visual and the photometric for Betelgeuse, it's, it's like, why would people do visual when obviously the photometric be so much more precise. So what's the value in people actually just do, continuing to do visual, other than saving a whole bunch of money on equipment? Uh, my, my answer is it's not really much value. Um, the, the reason I've seen uh, CDA VSO um, promotes uh, visual, um, visual obser observing of variable stars um, as one of its uh, training programs or ways of uh, uh, interesting beginners, motivating beginners to get involved. So they have a list of 10 stars. Not even sure if Beetlejuice is one of them, but uh, there's occasionally been some excitement to they or others try to generate about, wow, get an observation of Beetlejuice, compare it, uh, look at it, it's changing brightness. It's a great target to, to observe visually. And maybe you can, maybe you can. Uh, there have been people who have been doing this for decades and they don't seem to be too bothered by the fact that um, to, uh, it, to put it one way, it's sort of a waste of time when there's so many uh, photometric observations that are more useful. However, I think it's not a waste of time because it motivates some people to, um, to find it fun to look at, uh, fun to look at uh, maybe school children or first time sky, sky gazers can get excited about it and say, hey, you can, you can make an observation of this variable star. Um, you can actually see it changing because you, you can see it you know, by change maybe half magnitude a lot of people can detect that quite well. Um, say, hey, this is interesting, and get excited about it. And because um, I know years ago that there was um, um, some noise about the um, too many of the beginner stars were in Orion, because Orion was uh, chosen as a great constellation to watch numerous variable stars in it that were ideal for beginners. So too many people, beginners, uh, possibly school programs or whatever, were focusing on Orion are getting a huge swamp of data for several variable stars in Orion. So I think it has visual appeal, um, maybe some excitement about it that um, motivates people to look at the sky. So it's been promoted, I think, for that basically that sort of reason. So that's my best answer to your question. Any other questions over here? Um, let me go because I think yeah, it's been up for a while. Is your equipment powerful enough to spot transiting exoplanets? Uh, interesting question because uh, basically no. Um, the answer to that is that that's normally done with so-called CCD photometry, um, where I can get away with a much tighter, uh, smaller field of view. Um, uh, the, the, sh the longer answer is that if I'm considering setting up my C11, uh, 11 instrument Cassegrain, because it could do it, it could handle that. It could handle much fainter stuff. It could handle some stuff like um, photometry of Jupiter's Galilean satellites, um, spots and feature markings on Mars, um, and some other planetary projects that I think would be pretty interesting. So um, with that telescope, or a powerful enough telescope, more than what I'm using now, yes. Currently, right now, no. I'm extremely busy just with variable stars. Thank you. Hi, uh, I've got a couple. Qu I've got a question for you and a couple comments, if I may. <laughs> sure. Go ahead. My my question is: Is your photometer a self-contained device, or do you need to plug it into a computer? Uh, interesting question because I didn't. I avoided mentioning that um, self-contained device has a digital readout. Um, it does have a plug for computer output. <clears throat> so um, I've chosen the way I do it. Uh, I uh, try to keep the answer concise. I do it by writing down the numbers on a pad and then typing them into the spreadsheet. The longer answer is yes, um, it is capable of out outputting through a plug made for that purpose into software. And I actually did that uh, years ago, decades ago, I started to do that. Um, and uh, the reason I stopped, um, and actually Optech, the manufacturer of that photometer makes software and the hardware for interfacing. And in fact, I'm, um, as far as I can tell, in the current AAVSO photoelectric photometry program, 
of several dozen observers, I'm about the only one who does it manually. And it's because um, I found that, um, uh, I showed you in the last slide, I claimed it's fun and relaxing. But the way it can become not fun, not relaxing, is start arguing with cables that have wonky connections and don't connect perfectly and um, get a whole set of observations. It seems to be going great, downloading into the computer, and then why does it suddenly stop? Then I got to trace back, why is the cable loose or why is the wire not connecting? Why is something um, not in, the, in the laptop not recognizing something all of a sudden? So it can be turn, instead of being fun, it can be pretty darn aggravating when I do it through the cables into the laptop. And it's, so I've decided it's way faster, way more fun just to do it manually. So that, um, hopefully that sort of answers the question that yes, it can be done electronically. Uh, do you mind if I offer a couple of comments? Oh, glad to hear them. Okay, uh, for visual observing, uh, the AAVSO does have what they call the legacy observing program, where they're inviting people to observe a limited number of stars visually so that they have a continuous um, series of observations done the same style going back 100 years or so. So there is still some value for visual observing. Um, the other comment I was going to make is, uh, while the sky surveys are making an awful lot of variable star observing obsolete, I think it's still going to be uh, viable for things that change rapidly, cataclysmic variables, um, things like that, where the changes are happening faster than the sky surveys are keeping up to, most of which are collecting between one to four observations a night. So I think uh, we still have some work ahead of us in the future. Yep, I agree 100%. So I'll comment on those comments. And um, first one was about legacy objects. And so one complication with the um, automated sky surveys is that a value of ongoing visual observations is that they'll form, um, they'll form uh, what's the word, um, um, a background basis um, for comparison. So in case, in case the photometric sky surveys appear too wonky or, or change too much, there'll be a, a good solid background for continuing visual observations of those legacy stars. The exact same thing applies on solar sunspot observing. Um, the record has gone back several hundred years by visual observers and continuing visual observation forms a good basis, uh, or there's a better word I can't think of offhand, for comparison of the current satellite measurements which, which can do it automatically. And so um, the visual observers will always have uh, some value, yes, especially for particular stars, for sure. Uh, and so you mentioned another, another comment is about the dwarf novae is one example. Uh, I have to say that um, it's plain fun. It's really exciting to look at a dwarf nova, such as um, one of my favorites being SS Cygni, among others. Um, you look at them once in a while, and all of a sudden, one day you look at it, it's, it's blasted into outbursts. And that's really fun. That's really neat to see. It's just amazing to see. So that justifies continuing to do it, even just for fun. Even if the um, uh, visual observations are obsolete, because of the photo uh, automated photometry servers can do a better job, it's still fun to watch them. It's really fun. It'll be an um, enjoyable hobby for the rest of my life while I, whenever I can continue, as long as I have the ability to continue physical visual observing. So it'll be fun. Um, so it continues to be fun, uh, it will be fun. Um, the other uh, value for visual observations is um, during twilight, which you briefly alerted to, that when the photometric sky surveys can't handle it, they can't go too close to the sun, but visual observers can. They can look in morning twilight or evening twilight, catch their favorite variable star. Maybe it's an outburst, maybe it's got some variation, which the photometric sky surveys can't do because they're programmed to not go too close to the sun. So there, yes, you're correct. There are some uh, ongoing values for visual observing, despite it becoming mostly obsolete by um, programs coming online. But yes, good comments, I agree. All right, we have a question over here. Is it known why the magnitude of Betelgeuse dip? Yes, uh, the reason why the magnitude of Betelgeuse dipped was because of a cloud of dust. Cloud of dust got um, emitted from it, uh, so it's, it's fairly well, a bit of more background. It's well known that um, red giants, super giants uh, have, are, are sooty, um, create some dust, some molecules. And in this case, it's been decided that it, with a lot, by a lot of other observations and combined with the visual observations, that a huge cloud of soot got emitted from the star and um, blasted out into space an obstructed part of the star. So um, I think it's pretty neat. It's quite, um, quite amazing. There's a lot more details to it than that. Um, but basically, that's what happened. That's the reason why. Thank you.
Uh, any, anything online? We have one question from Zepfan Zepfan, and he asks if Frank has tried exoplanet detection. Um, I'm thinking if that's already been answered, if you can elaborate on that at all, or mention of any other observing programs that you know of for exoplanets, specifically in the AAVSL or any other astronomy organization. Uh, yes, so the short answer is no, I'm not involved in it. Longer answer is yes, the AAVSO has an exoplanet section where there are a lot of observers, a very good training program, a manual anybody can download for free, um, outlining which equipment to use and basically CCD or uh, what's the word, CMOS detector cameras um, are being used uh, to, to do very good work on exoplanet detection and measurements. So longer answer is yes. Um, I don't, <clears throat> I haven't gotten involved in it just because of time and resources and I'm, I can be busy full time just with my own little programs. Um, but there's, in the AAV of Seoul, there's loads of other programs that people would find interesting from spectroscopy to solar um, to uh, all sorts of um, eclipsing binaries as one form of variable star and many others um, besides eclipsing binaries, uh, besides uh, exoplanets. Uh, so there's a fully developed program there with um, instruction and courses for how to do it uh, and proper practices for doing it. And I'm just not involved in it, partly because of time. Frank, I have a question myself. Have uh, photoelectric photometers been displaced by CCD cameras? Yes, yeah, the answer is for sure. They're displaced, um, it's probably 20 years ago or more, um, people were stopping doing photoelectric photometry. I actually stopped too. I actually got a CCD camera and I was going to start into the CCD photometry because I was convinced. Um, you know, I go to the AVSO meetings and see that most people are doing CCD photometry and why are these old dinosaurs still doing photoelectric photometry? Um, and so, um, yes, it's replaced a lot of photometry and it's easy, it's, it's automatically done. Uh, people um, uh, program their uh, gear and observ observatories to do CCD photometry or CMOS uh, camera based now, but um, let's just generally refer to it as CCD photometry because that's how it began. Um, when CCD, uh, CCD uh, cameras became widespread and uh, you know, um, well, well known on how to use them a good 20 years ago or so. Um, and I still have the STT4 camera I got, but however, it was this case of, for me personally, it was this case of um, 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 needing connection to the laptop computer, saying why is it uh, causing hassles in the cold and um, cold weather and um, conditions where it's not looking, and so I got pretty darn aggravated, spending a lot of time under the stars, trying to troubleshoot things, trying to make things work. Whereas I found that with by continuing to uh, to do um, photoelectric photometry, photometry, it was really easy. It was just a breeze, partly because I was already familiar with it. I knew how to do it, and by doing it manually without connecting through any wires or lap or, or work to the laptop, it was too easy. Whereas the CCD photometry for me was pretty darn aggravating. And so um, yes, did, uh, a lot of people did switch to CCD photometry. Um, there's one other reason I should mention, and that is because I didn't show any examples. I didn't. I'll just very briefly mention error analysis, but um, I could show you a lot of light curves that people complain about on the AVSO website for any particular star where uh, there's some precise um, observations that line up really well with uh, whatever they consider to be reasonable. And there are a lot of outliers were done by a photometer that are way off. And so that's because people do it um, automatically. They uh, have their photometer, uh, their CCD photometry gear running all night while they're sleeping. Um, download stuff, uh, it does all the analysis automatically and it shoots it off to the database uh, automatically without people even looking at it, saying, is there anything wrong here? Uh, were there any clouds? Was there any aurora? Was there a contrail? Did any satellite shoot through? Nobody knows. Nobody cares. Or a lot of people don't care. So it's been one problem. One of the uh, complications for the AVSO has been quality, uh, data quality. They've been arguing with that for the past several years. They have a committee to try to deal with it. Um, but it has been a big question about, especially with automated photometry. Um, it can be done uh, so easily and so uh, efficiently that um, a lot of bad data end up in the database. And it's caused by the CCD photometers um, and their gear and their observations that people um, figure or assume is um, a great night's work. Um, the, the, the observatory did quite a lot of work and it shot all the data off to um, the database uh, by itself in the morning. and. Uh, sounds lovely. However, um, when you plot the light curves, say there's something wrong here. 
but um, we don't know. So um, there are a lot of complications with it. Whereas for me, um, manually doing um, photoelectric photometry, uh, photometry, it's fun, easy, and I can decide uh, when something doesn't work, um, data isn't quite right, there are some problems, throw it out, stop doing it, go to sleep, uh, that, that data isn't right, don't submit it. Um, so I find that fun and interesting. So that's the general answer. Very good, so uh, let's uh, stop here. Uh, thank you very much again, Frank, very interesting presentation.